Welcome, everybody. Thanks for letting us uh, kick off your APA experience. We're going to have a good time tonight uh, talking a little bit about uh, the forefront of uh, psychiatry and intersection with that in psychopharmacology. So you can get a rerun of this if you're masochistic enough to want to hear the full part of it, because mine's going to be about 30 to 40 minutes. We have about an hour and a quarter uh, online at, at our uh, website for free. And so we're going to talk tonight about this subject. The who, how, when, why, who, 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 uh, the pharmacogenetic testing. So why are we doing this? This is controversial or it's glamorous. It's been trashed and it's been lauded. It's uh, turbulent at the cutting edge of new science. And so it's fun to be here and why do we do this and what's the state of the art and where do you think this field stands? Well, in order to answer those questions, we're gonna talk about the existing known polymorphisms, which means a change in one of the amino acids in a protein due to a change in a base in a gene and what those are associated with both mental disorders and treatment. And I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to talk about diagnosis of mental disorders because we don't have any diseases in psychiatry. Anybody in this room treat schizophrenia? I don't. I treat delusions. I treat hallucinations. I treat, uh, you know, uh, symptoms. Anybody here treat depression? I don't. Uh, major depressive disorder has at least five of nine symptoms on a laundry list. You have to treat each one of those. And these symptoms cut across so many diagnoses. In fact, pop quiz, how many diagnoses are there roughly in DSM-5? Anybody know? Depending on how you count them, and some of them are redundant, let's say 158. Did you know that? I have nothing to do in my spare time. Actually, I had Megan Grady, one of my writers, do this. And then I said, Megan, okay, I'm thinking about writing this book on symptoms in psychiatry and the genes that control them, the neurotransmitters that control them, the circuits that they're in, and let's see what big a task it is. So if each diagnosis has three to 10 symptoms, I'm thinking, holy criminy, how many symptoms must there be? It must be maybe up to 1,000 symptoms. You know how many symptoms there are in the DSM? 79. Now, how can that be? It's because we treat symptoms. And symptoms are in different circuits. And different circuits, when they don't work right, can be put right by medications. And really, that's the cutting edge of what genomics is doing today. It helps inform us as to what might be wrong with the circuit and, therefore, what medication you might use to put it right. Now, we're not going to talk about diagnoses because that's not where it's at. We're talking about treatment. And we're not even talking about first-line diagnoses. We're really talking about what happens when the easy cases don't work because I don't imagine anybody's in here to learn how to treat the 80% of first-line patients on every treatment guideline that the APA and everybody else puts out. That's not why you're here. They don't bother you. They're easy to treat. But that other 20% or whatever it is of the people who don't get well with the first treatment they cause us headaches. When I stand up after a, a lecture or see people informally in the hall, everybody has two cases on their mind that's bothering the hell out of them. And they've tr failed all sorts of things. This is where pharmacogenomics comes in, is to help you rethink that case through. And that's really where the cutting edge is. So when, to be clear, we're not talking about diagnosis. We're actually not talking about first-line treatment. We're talking about treatment in people who don't uh, by the rules, because actually, I'm sick and tired of the tyranny of the median patient. You saw those, uh, you know, those uh, forest plots that he showed of all the antidepressants. They looked about the same. Okay, now let's say everybody in this room is is depressed. So we're going to give everybody the cheapest drug on sale because you're all the same, right? Your depression's the same diagnosis, right? Well, okay, we get away with that. It's probably cost-effective, and 80% of you will be better or, or at least have some response. 
um, what about the other ones? Well, you can go to hell. <laughs> because we don't care about you. There's no way to treat you. You just go next. Wh whoever gave you the last uh, prescription pad or the last uh, free cup of coffee, or I don't know how you choose the next one. So the reality is that we really don't know how to treat people that are bothering you, that make you drive you, come to the APA, come to a, or a I guess it's, it's a roast beef tonight, but I was going to say rubber chicken dinner tonight. That's why you're here is to figure out what am I going to do for those people? Because I don't treat median patients. I treat outliers, and so do you. And what you want to be is that little kind of naive Johnny on the spot person says, I know this patient can get better. I'm waiting for the outlier, the person who has this extraordinary response, because we've all seen them. And the question is, how do you improve the odds that that happens? Well, I think it's in part pharmacogenomics. So we're going to interpret a little bit of the testing data that comes out, in, including some of the ones that are in the test that, uh, that Genomine makes. So here we go, real quick. Now we're in college. We're at Genetics 101. What is this? It's a gene. Okay, got 23 and me of them, maybe 46 of them, whatever. And um, that is the type of gene, the sequence of DNA, the billions of base pairs that you've got. The genotype is that, but the expression of the gene is called the phenotype. No. <laughs> what a horrible gene expression that must have been. And the generic variance between you and me, I'm sorry to say, is less than a tenth of a percent. A scary thought if you ever had one. Oh my God. So really, the, and the difference between me and a chimpanzee is about 7%, although there are people who think it's actually closer. But, so it's really a very small amount of variance which is causing all the differences even between me and you, let alone between me depressed and me well. So we're talking about big time changes with our DNA that, from very small amounts. So let's go through this. What's the path from your gene to your phenotype? The phenotype would be whatever you want to call it, blue eyes, but you could also say major depressive disorder. So the genes make proteins or modulators of gene expression. And proteins regulate the efficiency of brain circuits to cause or treat symptoms. Those 79 symptoms that treat every psychiatric disorder known to man. And when those circuits don't work right, they give expressions. So depending which circuit, because the brain is topographically organized, so you over here see this circuit's gonna go crazy here. This crazy circuit is not functioning right. It could be too high, it could be low, mainly it's out of tune. And when it's out of tune, the smiley face becomes something else. And the expression of anxiety, depressions, hallucinations is depending on which circuit is sick and how it gets sick and whether it's out of tune, too high or too low. And if you look at that circuit as a string on a guitar or a violin, anybody play a stringed instrument here? When you pick it up, it's out of tune. And how do you tune it? With your fingers on the tuning bar. But if you go too far, it's just as far out of tune as if you don't go far enough. And so what you and I do all day long is tune guitars. We give drugs that block or stimulate receptors and neurotransmitters that are, have the fingers on these circuits that regulate them. It's actually amazing that we can do as much good as we can, because really when you're giving a D2 antagonist or a reuptake inhibitor, you're throwing the brain into a bucket of this drug, it goes everywhere, but you're tuning it, and it's amazing because that's the basis of how everything in psychiatry works. But wait, there's more! Epigenetics. You know, we used to think that uh, there would be a gene for schizophrenia and a different gene for depression. Um, well, that's ridiculous. There's never gonna be a gene for schizophrenia or depression. There may be, well, maybe, 12 genes, or maybe there's a panel of 200 genes and you have to have 16 of them sick, but the 16 you have sick for your depression is different than the 16 he has, the 16 I have. And then you've got, oh God, this gives me a headache. And in fact, if you look at schizophrenia, the most recent studies say there's like 108 genes that really are 
have a big time um, association with schizophrenia, big time meaning less than 1% of the variance. So that's already dizzying, but do you want to get a headache? You've got, you've got 10,000, 20,000 genes. I keep debating how many we got. Your normal genes cause mental illness, as well as your abnormal genes. What? Because a normal gene that's on when it should be off, or off when it should be on, is just as bad as making an abnormal protein from a gene. And so that's where we get the epigenetics, which is the expression of whether a gene is on or off. And so if the gene is on, it makes its RNA and it makes its product. Or if it's silenced, it doesn't do that. And that's got to be in synchrony or else things don't work right. And if I'm successful tonight, in every brain of every person at every table tonight, I have activated genes because you're learning and you're telling your old DNA, make me a new synapse, I'm going to make a new memory and I'm going to plug that sucker in and I'm making new proteins and synaptic vesicles and everything else. And that is experience because the factors that express genes, normal on and abnormal off, would be your prenatal environment, your early life stress. This is one of the biggest ways you can change a normal brain is early life. And those experiences that are adverse can almost permanently change a brain. Virus toxins, of course, substance use, even though are normal drugs, and yes, psychotherapy. Psychotherapy is an epigenetic drug. It's a, like teaching is an epigenetic drug. You're changing the brain's expression of genes favorably. So it's a little bit like London Bridge is falling down. If you have no risk gene, it's like here in San Francisco. What an apt analogy. Dr. Stahl has the Golden Gate Bridge. Now you think that that bridge is not a little bit over-engineered. In other words, they have a few more struts in there than they really need to keep it from falling down. Yeah, it's over-engineered. So if you put a little sports car across that bridge, that's not much stress. Bridge hardly notices it. You put a huge truck over it, it's still no problem. All right, let's take one of the struts out. Things going to fall down? Hmm, you think... A uh, sports car get across okay? Yeah, it's too okay. Even the truck gets okay. Oh, my gosh. How about two? Well, it's getting a little dodgy up there. If sports car, they'll go, oh, the truck almost gets there, but now you got multiple restines. Oh, my God, the bridge is barely standing up, and, and the, the truck, oh, the car will get over, but ah, I guess schizophrenia. So it's the issue of having the risk genes with the stress upon it that gives a mental illness. That's the model of every psychiatric disorders that we have. Does it tell you that the bridge is, is basically psychiatrically ill just because it's got struts out? No, any more than an abnormal gene is gonna tell you whether you have something for sure. It's the combination of putting the environmental input together with the gene to tell you whether you have a psychiatric disorder and even how to treat it. So what's the relevance of the genotype? Well, how could this tenth of a percent variance help clinicians understand how a patient develops a mental illness or how they will respond to treatment versus another, especially when it's simultaneously mediated by epigenetic factors? Because of this slide, many people say genetic testing is dead on arrival. It'll never tell us that. There's, things are way too complicated, and you, know, you just can't tell it. But I think that's based out of uh, maybe not understanding it quite and also a little bit of just uh, ignorance. So the one thing that we can do to sabotage this gene test going forward is to be naive. If I would imagine people who are crazy enough to be here in this room tonight have an interest in this, maybe even are champions for it, maybe you're skeptics of it. But if you get your test results back, what we wanna do is to make sure what they mean and, and do that accurately, because we don't wanna have false promises. So congratulations, I got my gene test back from that fancy new test I just heard about five minutes ago. No, I got a definitive diagnosis, right? Eh. There's no known gene for any many psychiatric order or symptoms and there's never gonna be one. Oh, jeez. All right, well, I can pick the perfect treatment for you to know exactly what's gonna work and what exactly is not gonna work and what's gonna have a side effect and what won't, right? Eh. 
Pharmacogenomic tests don't tell you that and never will. Well, now they're really useless, right? There's too much variance on a tenth of a percent, and it's not going to tell you this thing. And this is also the reason why people say this is just garbage and these are no good. Because if they don't tell you this, we're not going to pay for them. Well, wait a minute. What are the options? Oops, this thing is not moving forward now. There it goes. What is the old and classic model of psychiatric practice? Anybody like me trained last century? Actually, psychiatry has known the field of precision medicine before it became a term, before it was ever invented. We have practiced for a long time because we have treatment guidelines, certainly, in psychiatry, and it's based on evidence-based medicine. And so what's the evidence-based medicine? It's based on patients 18 to 65 who have no concomitant medical illness, who have no concomitant psychiatric illness, who do not have problems with uh, uh, tolerability of medications, who do not use substance abuse, have not a personality disorder, and who also uh, have never failed to respond to a drug, just like everyone in your practice. So if the light's shining down there, but my patient's over here in the dark, we tend to be like that bad joke where the policeman says why, why, to the guy who's a little intoxicated looking around under the street light, what are you doing, sir? He says, I'm looking for my keys I lost down the street in the dark. He says, why are you looking here? Because this is where the light's shining. <laughs> well, the light's shining is fine for 80% of the patients or primary care physicians who treat psychiatry. But what about the people who have problems with responding to the first-line treatment and where the guidelines don't exist? Other guidelines for your complicated patients, because they aren't for mine. So you have experience from training and practice, which actually helps you fill in those blanks. You've got your own intuition, God forbid. One of the coolest things about being in mental health today, I say over and again, is being in psychiatry, because it's the last field that combines art with science. You, you ever go to an internist? You don't get eye contact because they're taking care of their uh, electronic medical record and they're reading numbers off to you, right, for your test results. S surgeon doesn't even want to see you before or afterwards and you're asleep when they cut you open. Psychiatrist actually gives eye contact and actually listens to people and develops what's uh, a, an art of that, a feeling for that. Now the flaws of the old model, of course, were the thing called the recency effect. In other words, if I've just seen a yellow zebra I think there's lots of yellow zebras. If you don't believe this, buy a red Ford and then watch how many red Fords come down the road towards you. So there is a recency effect. Significant emotional event. If somebody gets really good after a drug or gets really bad side effect after a drug, you, it influences your odds of thinking of giving that to the next patient and shouldn't. Um, there's also eminence-based practice, which again is a flaw that some people like me practice, which there's <laughs> nothing about that. It's for the evidence, not eminence. <laughs> and what do you do when you have no evidence? And that's where pharmacogenomics comes in, because it's starting down the trail of giving you that evidence. So what pharmacogenomics, I think, can add to the modern model of psychiatric practice that makes you genetically informed, neurobiologically empowered, data-oriented, and it's a process I call equipoise. It's called weighing all the evidence. This is just some more evidence. It's not all the evidence. It doesn't tell you everything with one test. And you can practice without it. In fact, what evidence do you weigh? Say family history. Could you practice psychiatry and never take a family history? Yeah, I suppose so. Could you practice psychiatry and never talk to a uh, family member? Yeah, I suppose so. Could you practice psychiatry and not get pharmacogenomic tests? Yes, I suppose so. But the question is, is that ideal? I mean, I have a hard enough time figuring this stuff out with all the evidence I can possibly get my hands on. So I think it's important to weigh the evidence which then gets changed. It, it distorts things in the sense that new genetic evidence that says it's a little more likely you're gonna get better on this drug or a little less likely. It's a little more likely you're going to have a side effect on this drug, or it's a little less likely. Now, some people think that's trivial, it's not worth the, the, the hassle, and they would rather not have it. But I always tell my residents, in training for psychiatry, you should ask these two questions to your patients. Where's your daddy, and who's your mama? 
or maybe better, who's your mom and where's your daddy? What do I mean by that? So, for example, where's your daddy or your mama means, uh, who's your daddy or mama, I mean, that means, you know, what, what's your family history? So you should get a family history on people. Could you practice without it? Yes. And then the other thing would be, um, you know, where's your mama? Usually it's a mama because uh, you need to get a woman in the office with you. It's an informant. Why? Because women make 90% of health care decisions, all their own, all their children, and almost all their husbands and brothers and sisters. So if you go to a guy and you say, hey, have you had mania before? He goes, oh, no. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. And if his brother or father was there, they wouldn't either. Find a woman! <laughs> and so you bring them in and you get that information because you triangulate, because the information from the patient, from your own lion eyes, and from that informant, if they match, then all of a sudden you have reinforcement and you know what you're doing. And I propose to you that that's equipoise and adding genomic tests, I'm gonna show you some more, do that as well. But you have to be aware of red herrings. In other words, it's possible, have you ever treated somebody um, for a different disorder than they had a family history of? Well, that can't be because family history always tells you what the disorder is, right? Have you ever treated anybody uh, uh, for a disorder that uh, they didn't admit they had? Of course. And you will treat people with genomic testing that says you have a little less likelihood that this drug will work and you give the drug and it does work. So you don't use any one piece of evidence to dictate your outcome. It's weighing the evidence. All the time, I'm faced and you're faced with contradictory evidence. That's what we get paid the big bucks for, is because you have all this mutually contradictory data. You still gotta make a decision by the end of the appointment, what are you gonna do? And this says yes, and this says no. Well, figure it out yourself. That's where genomic testing comes in. It helps us add. So it's a strategy for where there's no evidence from large randomized controlled trials or if there is such evidence that it's all failed. Now, smart ass, what do you do? Right? That's what patients look at you. So the modern treatment of psychiatric practice is, of course, exhaust your evidence-based solutions first. No one would say otherwise. Then the thing that doesn't happen is after you exhaust it, the best thing for you to do is panic. So usually we don't think. What we do is just say, holy crap, well, what else haven't I tried? Or what did I just read in the journal? Or whatever. What dinner did I just go to? And here's a stall are you chirping about. Well, I'm going to throw that at the patient. That's no way to make a decision. And I think pharmacogenomic tests help you think. And so the idea is take another history. Because um, what I found is it's possible that when you see a patient and they're not getting better on this drug, and you give them another one in that class, and they're not getting better, and they're giving another one in the class, and not getting better, then all of a sudden this kind of profound thought comes, and the, the curtains part, and my insight goes, and I say, it's time to take a history. You know, like three years later after I treated the patient, right? Because we miss stuff, and that is useful. I'll bring in another informant. Um, Treatment-resistant depression could be bipolar with mixed features. It could be pseudobulbar affect. It could be dementia. There's, we make mistakes all the time. Rethink it. Collect new data, including genomics, um, and use this information to rebalance the evidence and come to a genetically informed, neurobiologically empowered, novel, and rational combination rather than something that's a product of panic. Think it through. And if you, yeah, I've told this to Ron, and I've told this to Gene of mine, I've told this to people who ask me whether I use these tests. What's the value of them? I think it's, it forces you to think. And maybe much of the evidence that you see from these tests is basically information that makes you rethink the patient and come with the most rational thing for them given all the information at hand. And of course, it's still a betting because we do that and patients still don't respond. But I think they get better responses and I think when you see genomic tests being used in some population compared to another population that didn't get it, part of the value of it in the population that did get it, in my opinion, is the people got the test, they had to stop and think and wonder of all the possible options, is there something rational that follows from these tests? So here's the modern model of psychiatric practice for the treatment resistant patient particularly in depression, but it's any kind of treatment resistance. 
It's nature plus nurture. The genes plus environment equals the psychiatric phenotype, in other words, the symptoms that you're having. And we treat symptoms, not diagnoses. And their super model of psychiatric practice is to put pharmacogenomic testing together with therapeutic blood levels, with neuroimaging testing, the patient's history of symptoms as they relate it, the patient's history of treatment as they relate it and you can document it, family history, and then get that woman, that informant, put it all together. And today that's sexy, it's called personalized or precision medicine. And I bet everybody in this room has been practicing that since you went into this field, because that's what psychiatry is. And we add more and more as time goes on. So what's interesting to me is that um, I'm gonna give a symposium, and not really give, I'm gonna chair it, it's some colleagues of mine from all places, Turkey. So in this thing, I have a, you know, 90 minutes, three different talks that I'm chairing, that they're giving the talks on precision medicine. And they're talking about quantitative EEG, they're talking about therapeutic blood levels, and they're talking about genomic testing. And when um, I was fortunate enough to be uh, brought to Turkey and I got an honorary doctorate from the university that does this, and I thought this Turkey, well, you know, whatever, you had the most incredible psychiatric hospital I've seen, you know, in a long, long time. Now, of course, these are rich Russians and rich Arabs and, and rich Uzbekistanis and whatever that are going to Turkey and getting this, but they have incredible care and they all get this. They all get tests that Americans don't get. Um, and it's really pretty eye-opening. And I, I'll go into a little bit about therapeutic drug monitoring, which I think is also a neglected thing as well. So now you have the test results and the question is now what? Pharmacogenomic testing and psychiatric practice, the current state of the art, is there's a dozen or two well-studied SNPs of which you can get from uh, the genomine test. Some are replicated extensively, others are not. And in fact, one of the frustrating things, if you actually are a scientist in this area, is every week a new study comes out. So you've got four tests in favor of this drug working and two that are neutral and one that's against. Then the next week there's another one in favor and three weeks later there's one against. It's always the balance of the evidence because it's not black and white. Each SNP has effects that are weak. There's no SNP that's gonna give you major depressive disorder and no SNP that's gonna tell you which drug's gonna make you better. There never is and there never will be. It only has maybe a percent, one percent of the variance. And or maybe in the future we'll have 100 or 200 tests and we'll be able to put it together in AI or something and figure out you know, exactly what's the best for you. In the meantime, we're capturing a dozen or two of these SNPs and doing it in the way in which we'll kind of go over the test results at the end. These are neurobiologically plausible. You know, if people were talking about keratin in your toenails that was changed that would make your antidepressant work or not, that wouldn't be biologically plausible, right? So what you have, though, are neurotransmitters and their receptors that have er variations that seem to sort with these things. That's how we think we tune these circuits and how our drugs work. So it's plausible that changes in those could help predict what gets used and what causes a side effect. Uh, there's always the danger of overinterpretation by patients or eager, unsophisticated, but well-meaning clinicians. But they're useful in developing these rational hypotheses for novel treatments or combinations of treatments in patients who are resistant to multiple agents. So that's where I think the real value of it is. The other thing it does, it gives hope and enhances optimism, motivation of prescribing pres uh, clinicians and provides a scientific basis. If it is somewhat weak, each one one percent, and it's still evolving to selecting agents. And so this is where we stand today, for better or for worse. And I think that the balance of the evidence still means it's worthwhile getting this information over not getting this information. I think it's where modern psychiatry is headed. Have you ever, uh, other also to know something about it, have you ever had this thing go in where Somebody goes to you as a new patient, uh, referred from several other, and slaps down these test results and say, what the hell does this mean? And they already have had the gene testing and they just put it in your face. H anybody had that happen? So that's happening more and more frequently. And, and some of my friends who don't know what they mean really decide, well, the, the easiest thing to do is to, to not admit that. So I'll say, these are, this is bullshits or whatever, you know, leave it alone, don't talk about it. 
But the reality is that um, it's, it's out there. And one nice thing about this, your cholesterol will change every time you measure it, but your genotype will not. So I always make sure that the patient gets a copy of it. And you say, what is going to change is not this gene, but what we know about it is going to change. It might even change by tomorrow. And over the next five or 10 years, and you may have a lifetime of this illness, and your family members may have it, this, this could be valuable information to keep on track. So what are the genetics of drug metabolism? If there's an area where it's more valuable and even some of the skeptics and even some of the payers are believing in it, it's where you're talking about metabolizing drugs. And you can go from poor to intermediate to extensive to ultra rapid metabolizers. That's the genotype. And the way you can figure that out by phenotype is the blood level. Now, Although I'm really championing myself genotyping more for treatment-resistant depression, we use much more of the blood levels in, in our place and actually in this really incredible hospital in Turkey for psychosis. Because blood levels will tell you whether the person, if they're not getting better, is what you call a pharmacokinetic failure. What does that mean? That means they're taking the drug and not getting enough in and that's easily fixed. It's called raise the dose above normal and then get the blood level again, and you would be amazed. Maybe, I would say, 15%, not, not half, but a significant minority of people have that simple problem. And, of course, if the levels are normal and the patient still isn't getting better, it's called a pharmacodynamic problem, and you probably have to change the treatment. So we can get both genotypes, which predicts phenotype, and the phenotype, and if you actually have somebody with a funny level, it's a very good idea to get your genotype because you can predict why they did, and the next drug they take, you're gonna be able to know whether you're in trouble or not. Now that is not rocket science. Is There's tables to help you out. We actually have them for you in, in, in these uh, uh, you know, various uh, appendices and in the tests that you heard about today. But wherever you get it from, you should know something about genotyping the way your liver eats drugs. And occasionally you can get, at least with selected agents, uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. It's coming back, I think, for treatment resistance. So what are the practical implications of testing the pharmacokinetic genes? Well, if you're a fast metabolizer, you have low blood levels, and if you have treatment resistant, you're probably adherent, but may require very high oral dosing or alternate routes of, of administration. If you're a slow metabolizer, by contrast, you'll have the opposite, high blood levels. Often people stop their meds because they can't stand them. They have side effects. And they might be adherent, but they may require lower than normal. T you know, I, I can remember the first time that I felt so foolish uh, is when the, some of this came out, there, you know, these, uh, say, 2D6 uh, poor metabolizers, which is like 15% of Caucasians. And I was at Stanford last century and my training and thinking this person was a crock, okay? You give them all the small amounts of drugs, side effects, side effects, side effects. There's no way that 25 milligrams or 10 milligrams of a tricyclic. Back in those days, we had tricyclic antidepressants. That's not something your daughter rides. It's actually a drug. So, and then we actually were able to get this highly experimental thing called a blood level. And we, this patient had sky high levels at very low doses, you think, oh my God, he really wasn't a, you know, making this stuff up. So you will see that. Not the most common solution to your problems and mine of treatment resistance, but it takes some of the weight off and already helps. How about the pharmacodynamic genes? Well, here's where more controversy exists because it is still uh, you know, in development and also, it's only a small amount of what you call the variance, or the cause of anybody's treatment resistant. So you got the famous serotonin reuptake pump, or transporter, sometimes called CERT, and the gene for it is listed there. And that gene comes in different sizes and shapes. And if the activity is high with the form of gene that you've got, that means you make more copies of the transporter. If you make more copies of the transporter, what's going to happen to your reuptake? It's going to be high, and if you have a lot of reuptake, what's going to happen to your synaptic serotonin? It's going to be low. On contrast, if you have the type of gene that makes fewer copies with less reuptake, 
serotonin levels will be high. And this does seem to interact both with diagnosis and with treatment. There are numerous studies suggesting that if you have the S form of this gene, you have more likely to get sick in a whole bunch of studies under stress. The gene doesn't by itself cause anything. It's like the Golden Gate Bridge with the strut out. But you put enough stress on it and you'll get depression more often than somebody who doesn't have that gene. If you're Caucasian, what's interesting is that the S form is in the minority in Caucasians and uh, Northern Europeans. And most of these studies were done in the US and in Northern Europe. And so all these came out and the next thing you know, I, I was actually in Japan and a Japanese guy comes up to me and he says, oh, Dr. Stahl, what do you think of these tests? I said, oh, they're very interesting. He says, uh, do you know that the uh, majority of Japanese people are S? And uh, they don't have any more sorting for depression in that group under stress. So you have to also factor in ethnicity. And actually, I'll just give myself another plug. I'm working with another uh, person to chair a different symposium on ethnicity in psychopharmacology because your genes and even the things that go along with that, like actually your habits and your diet and things that go, that, you know, that tend to sort with different cultures can change your relationship. So the bigger effect is in whether an antidepressant works or has a side effect in Caucasians. And so it is true that certain forms of the allele will do that. Now, not to go through the details, but just to summarize this very quickly, what's the practical implication when you get your test back? If you have the S or the L sub G allele form of the serotonin pump and a history of treatment resistant depression, you are going to be less likely to respond to a serotonin reuptake inhibitor and more likely to have side effects. Does that mean you will never respond to another one? No. But chances are you get this and you're going to have a patient who's had four of these guys already. And so it wouldn't take rocket scientists to say maybe the next time I give a drug for this patient it shouldn't be another serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And uh, that's what it means and that's useful information and you may go against that information but it's useful to put in the formula. There's a couple of different forms of the dopamine 2 receptor. Um, one is called an insertion form and one's a deletion form. And it's the promoter, not actually the gene itself. So it tells you if you're gonna make extra copies. So depending on which form you have, you have more copies of the D2 receptor. And the kind of information that comes out from that biology is studies like this. And this is also the very frustrating part of the study. The blue triangle is supposed to be where your eyes look, but if you're a skeptic, you would say, hmm, we got two of the studies at the bottom, which are on the one side of the curve, and the lines touch the, the, the horizontal line. So if, you're, if your vertical line touches uh, your horizontal line, it's the same thing as, as no change at all. Meanwhile, you've got two other ones where the square dot is on the other side of the line, but the long horizontal line touches the vertical. Those things were nothing, it means nothing's happened. But you've got two of the boxes that are not only on the left-hand side of the line, but they don't touch the vertical line. And you put them all together, you get the blue triangle. So is it a slam dunk? Everybody got better and they got a whole lot better if you had the one form of the dopamine receptor? No. But the practical implication is this. If you're thinking of giving an atypical antipsychotic augmentation to somebody who has treatment-resistant depression versus the other kinds of things you could do for them, and they have the delete allele, or copy means allele, and a history of treatment resistance, maybe you're less likely to respond to that antipsychotic, so maybe you just want to go away from that. And on and on. So I'm just going to go through another one. The alpha-2 receptor, interesting in ADHD. If you have one of the copies of the G type, you may be more likely to respond to stimulants than if you don't. Here's an interesting one. There's two genes that can help you about whether you're gonna get fat or not. Then it's the serotonin 2C receptor and the melanocortin 4. 
And if you have certain types of those two receptors and you're on an antipsychotic, you might be more likely to experience weight gain. So you know what? I don't know what you're doing now, but I was telling you, I do some consulting now for the state hospitals. Our famous most favored drug there is still olanzapine because we think it works a little bit better. But we're aware, of course, of the toxicity of olanzapine. So how do we resolve that dilemma? Well, we have violent patients who, who really have big time needs to have their psychosis under control. But the other thing we do, you walk in there skinny as a rail and you start olanzapine, you get metformin especially if you have one of these genes. Because pop quiz, what does metformin do? Prevent weight gain better or make you lose weight better? It makes you prevent putting the weight on. So it, maybe you want to give anybody with certain atypical antipsychotics metformin anyway. That's becoming the standard. But clearly, if you have the high-risk drugs, and particularly if you have the high-risk genes in the drugs, you might consider that. There's also two genes that have to do with excitatory neurotransmitter neurotransmission. There's the calcium channel, and if you've got a certain form of that, you might be more likely to have bipolar. So if you're chugging along giving antidepressant after antidepressant after antidepressant, nobody gets better, and all of a sudden you either get this or you get this one, you say, holy crap, maybe this person really is bipolar and I need to actually stop the antidepressants and give something else, like a mood stabilizer, lithium, or some of the atypicals. So in summary, I would say that genetic testing adds to the balance of the evidence, the equipoise, when making treatment decisions. It may be especially useful for patients who do not respond or tolerate a drug as expected. Caution is essential when bringing genetic testing into the selection of treatment in clinical practice. And it does help you think instead of panic. Thank you very much.